Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse DePlantis here. I hope you're enjoying our YouTube videos. That's why you don't want to miss anything. So like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you will know when new content has been posted. That's like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. So right now, watch this and be blessed. Write this down. When prayer mounts on the wings of fervor, answers come down like lightning. The other day I went to pray and the Lord said, I already answered that. I said, well, what about that? He said, I already answered that. I said, one more. What do you think of that? I already answered that. Then I realized what he was saying, that my answers were an unseen truth that was soon to manifest in the physical. Then I realized he didn't really want to discuss those things. He wanted to talk about something different. Then I, I thought, my God, all I got to do is just wait and wait, not wait long, just in other words, it's coming my way. So I begin to pray with fervor and the lightning begins to come down. You see what I'm saying? Yes. See, this is the how to's of believing the unbelievable and getting it. Remember about that unseen truth and that environment and that atmosphere. Now, I said this a while ago. I want to get on this. He says, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. OK, coming to God tells me there's a distance between you and me. There's a difference. There should never be distance between us and God. Faith destroys all distance between us and God. In Jeremiah 29, 13, he said, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Why can't people believe in God? Because they're searching for him with their head. He said, your heart. It really is called the gift of faith. That's why scientists cannot seem to, even though God's all around them, they can't see it because they're trying to search for him with their head. Einstein, all his life, had to fight the rumor that he was an atheist. He never was. He believed in God. Did you know that? In fact, on his deathbed, some of you may have heard me say, I think it's one of the, I've read a lot of Einstein stuff. I mean, I, I'm an avid reader. I read all kinds of stuff. But he was, you know, he, he was working on mathematical equations right before he passed away. I mean, he, they say, he, give me a pen, you know, because math is the universal language. For the universe, according to that, you know, to get the equations, E equals MC square, energy equals matter times the speed of light square. You know, you got to understand those things because a lot of what you're sitting on is come out of that formula and what we feel. Anyway, to make a long story short, this lady was, uh, the nurse was fixing his bed. And uh, he just looks up. He said, excuse me, do you believe in God? And the nurse didn't know what to say. This is true. She goes, um. Dr. Einstein, yes, I do. He goes, hmm. he went back to doing these things, you know. And the nurse says, I just had to ask him myself. So she said, she must waited for a few seconds. She said, Dr. Einstein, do you believe in God? And he had his glasses like this, you know. And I love what he said. He says, I'm trying to catch him at his work. <laughs> Let that sink for a minute. Because he knew that all he is, he thought out of the box constantly. That everything he's thinking, he said that God does, not, one of the most famous statements, God doesn't shoot dice. Or in other words, it just didn't happen. It's not a gamble. But I love that statement. I'm trying to catch him at his work. Then he went back. And then about 4, 35 o'clock the next morning, you know, he passed away. Now, my opinion, I believe he made it to heaven. Because when you get that far out there, you're going to run into God. Y'all got that. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> You're going to run into him no matter what. I had a man cuss me out on a plane one time. I had my Bible. I was reading. He said, excuse me. This is when I was flying commercial. This was on a Delta plane. I said, yes, sir. And I never sit in the, in, in the window seat. I always would sit in the aisle seat. I always try to get them aisle seats, you know. You believe in God, huh? You're a preacher? I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, I don't believe in your blankety blank God. Ooh, man, the Tabasco sauce began to come up my leg. <laughs> I wanted to lift my hands and praise God and slap the bar. Oh, excuse me. I, I mean, this. oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. And then all of a sudden he opens up this uh, penthouse magazine, pops it over to the centerfold. He said, hey, preacher, what do you think of that? This is on the plane. 
And I, I, I looked at it. I looked at him. And I went, hmm. And I went over to the red parts of the Bible and I said, what do you think of that? <laughs> he goes, and he, he used an ex, expletive, whatever you call it. And I went on to read and I said, God, I don't like this guy at all. By that time, this is when you could smoke on a plane. Bing, bing. Fasten your seatbelt, please, and put out your cigarettes. We're going to be encountering some turbulence. Well, I've been used to turbulence before, you know. I said, okay. But not this kind of turbulence. You could see the flight attendants. So, boy, they're all buckling down. See, all of a sudden, things get quiet. Even babies kind of quit crying. And the pilot comes on and says, uh, we have a lot of thunderstorms. We've been in circle. We're going to have to fly through, not through some of them. We're going to try to stay on the outer edges as much as we possibly can. And lightning starts hitting. And I'm going, oh, Jesus. Now, I see this atheist. Look, he's going, I see him. I wanted to say, why don't you read your penthouse, fool? <laughs> That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. You know, I'm trying to be nice. I mean, it's getting bad. All of a sudden, it's getting black. Boy, he's trying to get level, doing everything. I mean, we're getting him up, lip, bam, just hitting all that kind of stuff. And I just so happened. I just turned to look, and when I did this lightning bolt, bam, hits the engine. Now, the fuel's on the wing. Boom, she blows up like a movie. I go, good man. Lord. First thing I went, man, people go, ow. Oh! And that captain says, get ready for heavy flame and smoke. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And we had 33,000 feet, buddy. He takes that yoke or whatever you call that thing, stick, and pushes it. <laughs> and that atheist, out of his mouth, he went, oh, God. <laughs> I said, he don't exist. Enjoy your death. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it, but I, I just felt so good. He was trembling. What I should have done was pick up an offering. I'd have got all the back tithes. <laughs> oh, trembling. And the Lord said, are you going to allow the devil to kill you? I said, I'm on a plane. He said, I know where you are. I'm talking to you. <laughs> I unbuckled my seatbelt, which you shouldn't do. And I stood up. I pushed my way past that atheist. And I hollered from the top of my line, in the name of Jesus, I command the devil to get away from this plane. All y'all ain't got to worry about nothing because God said with long life would he satisfy me and show me my salvation. And people went, amen. <laughs> and you know, I mean, the, they shut the engine off, man, you got all that black soot all over that stuff. And they said, you got to sit down. And one guy said, let the man say what he want to say. <laughs> True story. But I'll never forget those words. Get ready for heavy flame and smoke. That atheist that day, he looked at me, he said, oh, Reverend, I, I, I want to apologize. I, I, I want to apologize. I said, it's wonderful to believe in God when you think it's over. He said, I think I'm going to church. Where do you think I should go? I said, now that I can't say. I said, but if you give me your hand, I'll pray with you. He said, in front of everybody? I said, but ain't nobody can get off, brother. <laughs> We're on the plane here. You want to walk off? No, 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 no. <laughs> I said, God will help you. I believe that old boy went to church. I believe that old boy today is born again. I, 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 I can't prove it's true. You can't prove it's not. But I'll tell you what, if you just saw his face, I bet he got, I bet he got tattooed with a cross. <laughs> He got a revelation that day. So. What was his problem? What was his problem? Distance. Distance. Between him and God. And that's when God said, for he that cometh to God. If people made history by trusting themselves, what could they not do by trusting Christ? What could you not do? Yeah, a lot of people made history by trusting themselves. One well, thing you got to give it to Napoleon. He wasn't a very big guy. About five foot, five foot one, five foot two. 
but he believed he could conquer the world. And he actually believed in the divinity of Jesus. A lot of our first presidents were deists. They didn't know if Jesus was actually the son of God, but they believed in God. Did you know that a lot of people don't realize? You have to, you have to study history, find out where we come from and how we got where we are and where we're going. But Napoleon said, I know he's God because I know what man can do and what he done, no man can do. That's an exact quote for Napoleon Bonaparte. I know what man can do and what Jesus did, no man can do. He's got to be God. Isn't that something? So if people made history by trusting themselves, what could they not do by trusting Christ? And let me say this. The inner spirit must refuse to accept limits. Now I want to deal with that for a minute. I refuse to put limits on my life. The inner spirit must refuse to accept limits. Now, brother, this is how it starts. Now, brother, I know you believe in God and you want to do this thing, but I mean, don't get crazy with this thing. Well, we're not being crazy with this thing. We're just doing what the Lord told us to do. And you're going to have all this information coming to you saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, and I'm not denying that, but I can do all things through Christ. And then you can tell when, he, when the spirit, a spirit that's not of God's aggravating them, they get aggravated when you tell them what God says. But the Lord said, I can do all things through Christ. And don't get stuck. It rises up. Don't get stupid. Don't quote scripture to me. That's exactly what you need. So I refuse to accept limits. That's how I built this place. And I'm using this as an example. That's how I, I, I got the plane. When the Lord told me to believe for a plane, I, I couldn't even get a new car. But he had taken me to an lim, uh, unlimited, and he says, now stretch. I mean, how many times, Mark Fessler is my, uh, uh, one of the board of directors of Jess Plans Mansion, I know his mother and father, they're here. And how many times we sat down and they're in the aviation business and FBOs and things of that nature. FBO means fixed base operator. Okay. Well, uh, corporate aircraft comes in and they refuel planes and take care of it. How many times we talked about when we were believing God for that plane? Well, you know, and why did I talk to his father? Well, because he understands aviation. And not one time did Brother Fester say, now Jesse, now Jesse. And you know, he know something about aviation. And Martin, they know aviation. Now, this ain't just somebody talking here. Now, you know, you, got, you can't. You're going to have to start off with a 172 Cessna, which is one engine, which means a goose can fly faster than that thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice plane. <laughs> if you got one, don't get mad at me. Now, for God's sake, they're nice. You learn to fly. That's why you first start out flying, you know. But not one time that this couple right here, y'all do this so people know who I'm talking about, these two people right here, or Mark, come on, that ever said, now Jesse, you just, you just can't do that. They said, you know, you need that to preach the gospel. <coughs> yeah. Now, I didn't know how to fly it. I didn't have a pilot. I didn't have a mechanic. I knew nothing about aviation other than commercial flying. People said, why don't you fly commercial? Because they can't fly my schedule. When I want to go to New York, I don't want to go to Atlanta. <laughs> Why do I want to stop in Atlanta? I'll stop in Atlanta if I'm going over to Creflo's. I need to get to New York. When I want to go, <laughs> watch this. When I want to go to Dallas, excuse me, when I want to go to Shreveport, I don't want to go to Dallas first. We flew over Shreveport. Let me jump out. <laughs> but you got to go to Dallas or you got to go to Houston, catch a flight coming. Isn't that a waste of money? You went somewhere you're not supposed to go. But what Dick was saying and, and what Mark was saying, that you can do this. I want to tell you something. It was impossible. So I found me a guy who would believe with me for impossible. That was me and Brother Copeland in South Africa. I said, we're going to get these intercontinental guys. He said, you know we will, bless God. <laughs> now, it didn't happen the next day. I wish it would have. Because if God would have dropped a plane out of the sky, Mike, I went, uh... What do I do with this? <laughs> I got to have somebody know how to fly it. And do you know my pilots, I think David's around here somewhere. I have to trust them with my life. Yeah. And sometimes they don't act like they know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, is they know exactly what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. We were flying into Keith Moore and Phyllis Moore's church in Branson. Now that's a new airport. 
Now, all the planes, they, they put these, uh, uh, the planes need to know where, the, air, uh, where the, uh, the, the tarmac is or the runways. There's some kind of a system that you put in your plane. As we were flying, I heard a voice from my plane. And Kathy with me, pull up, pull up, low terrain, you pull up. I thought, Jesus, pull up, David, <laughs> for God's sake. And yet he was on the glide slope. He said, I can see it. And that plane went to screaming, pull up, pull up, it wouldn't quit, pull up. And even David back there, he knew he was right. But when you have a sound that's coming at you, that's not right. It will affect you at times because it's breaking into your atmosphere and in your environment. And I saw David grab the, he said, he said, boss, I'm right. I said, you better be right, sucker, because we're going to be dead in a few minutes if you're not right. Pull up. Pull up, I look at Kathy. And Kathy, she goes, oh, come on, 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 come Thanks a lot. We forgot to tell you this. This thing is not in the system yet. And if they make a mistake, that plane going to tell me. It's got a voice. Too low. Flaps not down. I hear it. It talks to Am I correct, David? That thing will talk to you. 500 feet. 200 minimums, minimums, minimums. I like to listen to that plane talk. And they'll, they'll put that plane down. And it's just amazing how that works. But I said all that to let you know, I got around people that understood that atmosphere and that environment to help me, to take me where God wanted me to go. And you need to get around people and what we have here is people of like precious faith. And I'm not saying this because this is our meeting here, but we need to hang together. In other words, you need to support me and I need to support you. We got to get together, brother. In other words, if the devil go to attack, son, all of us just line up and say, you want some of me? Because you won't fight him. I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. And if we will stay in that unit, it's amazing what God will do for us. The inner spirit must refuse to accept limits. Let me say this in close. Never be blind to blessing or oblivious to opportunity. You never should be blind to blessing or be oblivious to opportunity because opportunities don't come very often and you must seize them. When I say seize them, I mean you have to grab them, but make sure that the opportunity is from God Almighty, which is going to take me in tonight. Abraham had an opportunity Ooh, to be the father of faith. Amen. But his background got confused with the voice of God. Because what was abnormal, when you see abnormal so much, it becomes normal. And the mixture begins to take place. And in that wonderful time that Abraham, and I'm going to give you this nugget here, was being positioned to be the father of faith, Satan was trying to kill the seed of Christ. Isaac was a type of Christ. Now, let me say this again. I know I'm throwing them tidbits out. He said, take your son, your only son, and offer him up. He did not say, slay your son. And many preachers for years, have, even though we preach that God will raise him from the dead, we've struggled with that. That tells you if you're struggling with the scripture, Satan has mixed something there that you're not seeing. Because one thing about God, buddy, he's very easily understood. Because his yay is yay and his nay is nay. There ain't no gray areas with God. But you see, because of his past, and I'll drop this and I'll go back to this oblivion. And this is what I'm going to deal with tonight. Do not misread God's message by being influenced by what you've seen or how you've been raised. Because there are things in this Bible that will protect us. 
Try ye the spirits, whether they be of God or of the flesh. We get so used to hearing God's voice that we quit testing it. It just becomes normal. But then the abnormal is slowly slipping in. And before you know it, Satan's in the middle of something God wants to do. And, if, and I'll say that if God wanted to stop, if God wanted to send that angel, he'd kill that boy. Now, imagine the horror for three days. He's got that on his mind. Imagine the, uh, what, the pressure? Yet I love God and you, you I'm a hundred years old and you gave it this boy. Think about that for a minute. Never be blind to blessing or oblivious to opportunity. What I love about Isaac, he was willing to go down for his father. If that had been my daddy, he'd have chased me all over that mountain. I said, listen to me, I love you, you old fool, but you crazy. But you see, sometimes you're taught so much something that wrong becomes right. When it's still wrong, because wrong is never right. Wrong is always wrong. You see what I'm saying? But that's for tonight. I want to get into that. And, 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 and I know many of y'all, when I said that last night, I saw preachers go, mm. I saw Don lean over his wife. <laughs> Richard said, I got my Gideon Bible out. He's in the hotel. <laughs> and if you think you can't find the word slay. God can't say kill and then write a law that says thou shalt not kill. He cannot. Let me help y'all. He cannot alter what he says. How you know that? Psalm 89, 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. If you can't remember that verse, when you leave the church today, when you walk out into the parking lot, look straight up by the steeple, you'll see that verse. I look out of my office. My, my, my office is in that executive building over there. And I, when, I, when I go by the window, I says, that's all I see, Eddie. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. Now, let me close with this. When you're not oblivious, uh, you can't be oblivious to opportunity or blessing. When God opens an opportunity for me, first thing I do, I don't care how good it is. I don't care how great it sounds. I go to the test. Is this of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Do I begin to go down line upon line, precept upon precept, concept upon concept. And all of a sudden you can you can tell when it begins to back up. Get out of here. And most people have made mistakes not by big things happen, the slight things. You know why you don't see much about demons anymore? Remember years ago how demons would manifest in churches? I'll give you an example of that. I was preaching in North Louisiana. And I had about eight or nine people I was praying for, Don. And I, I, so I prayed for this person. The Holy Spirit touched that lady. She goes, so I'm praying like that. And about three people down, this lady goes. Rrr, rrr. And I look over there and the pastor is right here. He went. <laughs> now, this is similar God people now. You know, they believe in the Holy Ghost, Pentecost, okay. Rrr, rrr. And the people I'm praying for, like, you can see in their eyes, hurry up and pray, Jesse, I, I, I want to get out of here. I'm going to go back to my pew. So I could see that. See, the devil's trying to bring attention. So I look at the pastor, I said, go over there and cast that devil out. He says, I don't like devils. <laughs> I said, go over there and cast that devil. He said, I'm scared of devils. <laughs> Says this to my ear. I said, you can't be scared of devils. You're the pastor. He said, I don't care. I'm scared of devils. <laughs> I said, that devil's just trying to destroy this. So get over. I'll be over there in a minute. But I got to finish praying. But he can go. <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> so I'm praying. I think some people just, you know, they, they, uh, people fell out in the Holy Ghost just to get away from it. <laughs> get away from this devil, you know. <laughs> Give him a courtesy drop. Because <laughs> this devil going. And I said, cast that devil out. <laughs> it's so funny. He goes over there, he said, in the name, in the name of Jesus, come out, devil. The devil said, I'm out. <laughs> he goes, but Jesse, the devil out. I said, the devil ain't out. <laughs> and then 
the devil said, no, I'm out. I, I, I'm out. <laughs> By the time I got to her, and all of a sudden, this sweet little lady turns into a raging, I will kill you. I said, you can't kill nothing in the name of Jesus. I meant, boom, she grabbed me. We rolling all over the floor. And there's the pastor. Come on, Jesse. Come on. Going. You're on your own, brother. <laughs> this is your revival. I, I, I ain't got to name it. It was funny, but it wasn't funny. But we got the devil out of her. Kind of gross. Spit all over the place. And one man comes and says, Better burn that shirt. <laughs> I said, What? Got, you got that devil spit. <laughs> He said, my Lord, man, he said, them spit, they like to start crawling. <laughs> oh, God, stupid stuff. I said, for God's sake, y'all Pentecostal. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> and I asked the head deacon, I said, man, I'm rolling all over this floor. I mean, devils are strong. I mean, she's, I mean, her face is this close. Ah, and I'm holding her arm like in that spit flying. I mean, I'm just... I, was you afraid? No, man, I'm just rebuking the devil. But I wanted the guy to kind of help me. I said, how come you didn't help me? He said, I never did like that woman when she didn't have a devil. <laughs> he said, I don't care if she does have a devil. She can go to hell for us. I'm just, I, I, I ain't messing with her. I'd love to tell you the name of that pastor in that church, but I can't. It, <laughs> And the next night we had revivals, Tuesday night. That was on a Monday night. He said, let's all praise and worship. He goes, he said, you see any more of them neighbors in there, brother? Oh, glory. And I did something I shouldn't have did. I said, that woman over there got a demon. He goes, but just that's my wife. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm just joking. He said, I tell you, I think she got a devil. <laughs> You know. <laughs> now you don't see much of that because you know why it scares people and if it scares people the devil can't operate and function so he, he doesn't manifest too much strongly because it scares people he get, he get run off so he does things in a slight way he's smart enough to figure that out but every once in a while he just gets raging mad and just loses it and he or sister start screaming. Boy, me and Brother Copeland, we, we've seen some devils, son. I saw a devil spit right in Brother Copeland's face in England. Remember that, Kathy? Can't look at him. He goes, ha, 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 ha. I said, good God, the devil spit in Brother Copeland's face. And I, I'm, what came in your mind? I'm going to beat the hell out of that. Spit, spit in my friend's face. Anybody in England at the International Believers Convention? Was anybody there that saw that? Well, you got it. Yeah, I know you were there, Kathy. I, know you. I mean, put a big loogie on him. I'm talking spit, boy. I know it's kind of gross. I made me so. I got, a, I got in the flesh. I'm going to punch that sucker. I come running over there. You devil from hell. I'm going to minister to you right now, sir. And Brother Copeland laughed. <laughs> Embarrassed that devil. Just crumpled. Boy, that night I said, Kenneth, that does me over. He's, I said, what, what, what was you thinking? He said, I, I'm going to knock her. <laughs> I said, I don't understand that. He said, but the anointing just took over and cast that devil out. Now, why did the devil allow, the devil wasn't allowed to do that. Everybody was just in such shock. But I'll never forget that. It made people mad. People immediately, one lady came and she said, I fast and prayed all day. Let some devil manifest now because I'm hungry. I know I can cast them out. <laughs> you got some people, but if you just get hungry, you got enough power to cast them out. You know, Jesus said, these don't go out except by prayer and fasting. <laughs> Where do people come up with these things? I have no idea. One man told me Jesus was an Indian. He was the chief cornerstone. Can you believe that? <laughs> I, I know that sounds stupid. That literally was told to me. I'm telling you, Jesus was an Indian. So I, I, I'm not saying that to make you funny. It's so funny because they believed it. 
One man told me one time, you know, Jesus had a dog and his name was Moreover. I said, what? You know, the Bible said, Moreover the dog came. <laughs> Moreover the dog. Yeah, that's the dog name. Moreover. Come over there and lift the dog. Guys, like, that's Jesus' dog. Moreover. Good God. I said, I guess you think God's name's Howard. Why you say that? Howard be thy name. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can, just, you can just flat get stupid. What's your name? <laughs> Wouldn't that be embarrassing? What's your God's name? Howard. <laughs> Howard. Howard be thy name. That's his name. And more over his dog. <laughs> now, I'm not just saying that to make you fun, to make you laugh. They, they literally believe that. Boy, I tell you what, I thought, God, we got some dumb people in the body of Christ. <laughs> I'll say this in close. But I said, why, why, why are you blessed? Because I believe he's a rewarder. Amen. Now, I'm going to get into this other thing on the end of it. And I'm going to pull Mary in this thing too tonight. I don't want you to miss tonight. Because this gonna, revelation is going to flow. I'm not just doing that to brag. I'm telling you, it's going to flow. Yes. You're going to see your vision clearly. But you're not going to see it very long because it's going to manifest that you're going to have to dream something new. Go ahead and dream something. <laughs> that people actually believe some of the things that they believe. It's amazing to me. And they always say this. You know, the Bible says, I said, really? What does it say? Well, it says in the. Well, you know what the Bible says. Go and find it yourself. <laughs> you don't know what the Bible says. You'd be surprised how many people do that, you know. I had a lady coming to me. She said, the Lord told me to give you a million dollars. I said, good. She said, I'm starting off right now. Here's a dollar. <laughs> That's been 32 years ago. I ain't seen that one since. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I appreciate that. That's just such a blessing. <laughs> the reason why I'm blessed, while this is all debt free, it's because we believe he's a rewarder. I don't know how many times I've come in and kind of like I've done the M&M, my, my, I call my grandbaby M&M, and we want to buy her something. I, the Lord has something for me. Why? Because you don't have to have a need for God to bless you. But that's been taught for 2,000 years. I'm developing that. Maybe when I get to y'all churches, I'll have it developed or something. Just, just flowing. You, you don't have to have a need because you do a lot of things for people that don't have need. Because you just want to be a blessing to him. And I said, God, why'd you do that? He said, I just love it. thought maybe you might like it. I was at Jimmy Hester's church years and years ago at Arlington Christian Center. This was probably, what, baby, 20 years now. You got to watch what you say because God hears everything you say. I was flying on Southwest Airlines to Dallas to go preach for him. I looked at my fingernails. And I noticed I had a little dirt under my fingernails. Mike said something. I said this out loud. Just to myself, I got to get me one of them case knives and get me a little pocket knife, case knife, clean my, you know, clean my fingernails. You know, that's all I said. I went to preach with Jimmy Hester. Watch this. Church was full, packed. We had about 2,000 people. They had a glorious service. They received an offering from my ministry. They said, but Jesse, we'll count it. If you don't mind waiting a little bit, we'll count it and we'll give it to you. I said, sure, fine. So we're sitting in the back of his office, having a little finger food, stuff like that, just fellowshipping. So here comes the finance person, you know, the kind of whoever that takes care of the church's finance. But Jesse, here's your check. Thank you. Oh, somebody put this in the offering. It's kind of old and had a little piece of paper attached to it for you. It was a case pocket knife. It probably cost $3, $5. It's very old. And I went, that was such a miracle to me. I went, oh. And the Lord said, I heard you say it on the plane. And this little knife was given to you. Was someone that loved this little knife and they wanted to sow it as seed. Now, I didn't, I've come to find out, I found out it was a little boy and it belonged to his father and his father gave it to him. You know what I'm saying? And I wanted to give it back. God said, Don't you do that. I still have that knife. But I walked out and I said, God, I could afford that knife. I could have bought that knife. He said, That had anything to do with it. I just wanted to love you. That has meant so much to me over the years. And you know, I've had some wonderful things given to me, but nothing has ever touched me as much as that little case pocket knife. 
because it came from a little boy who truly loved it. And I just happened to say it. And God heard it. So watch what you say, because you will get it on the bad side as well as the good side. What do you think about that? And I thought God would think that much of me to take time out of his busy schedule to move upon somebody to give me a knife that I can afford, a little small pocket knife, and I still have it. And every time I go look, so sometime when the devil said miracles, I hear people say miracles are not for today. I said, I won't show you a knife. I won't show, and they look at, they think that's so stupid, but they wasn't there. That was a blessing to me. And it still is. And it always will be. I will cherish it forever. And one more story and I'll close. Okay, I lied. But anyway. No, no. Just one more. Parkersburg, West Virginia. I was the night speaker at the Jesus Festival. Benny Hinn was the day speaker. I got it one day earlier. Parkersburg, West Virginia. I'll never forget it. In those days, I didn't have no money, but I mean, I had nothing. But Kathy said, you're going to be out there for three days? And all we got is $50. You better take this $50. I said, well, you gonna, no, we, me and Joe will be all right. So I took the $50. I said, I don't want to take it. I said, y'all take it. I said, man, I'll just fast. Take this $50. It just felt a little Lord to do that. We'll be okay. I said, all right, because in those days, Kathy would have to catch the bus to go to church. All right, we didn't have nothing. Okay? People don't know the beginnings. They just see the jet out there. They don't realize where we came from how we believed and stood on the word and you know all this kind of stuff so I go there and, so I go get a hamburger at, the, uh, at this place and I'm sitting there and there's a man named Dan who was about maybe th 20 yards from me all over on the other side of the restaurant and the Lord said give him all your money I said Jesus <laughs> uh, I'm going to pay this hamburger and I'm going to have about 47 dollars left he said give him all your money I said I don't know that guy he said I do <laughs> I said, okay, I saw, so I, I paid my bill, you know, I think it was $2.50, gave him a tip, whatever. I walk up to this man, I said, excuse me, sir. He said, yes. I said, the Lord told me to give you all my money. He said, excuse me? I said, this is $47 and some change. This is yours. He busts out crying. He was praying there, how am I going to get home? I have no gas, I have nothing. Now, I don't know any of that. So I thought, well, I guess the Lord want me to fast for three days out here. So I go out, to the, and, and, and the only thing you could buy was sloppy Joe sandwiches out there. At this, it was on the side of a mountain, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And I'll never forget Benny had, Benny had real long hair in those days. He said, I'm the day speaker. You just the plants. I said, yeah, I'm the night speaker. I said, you want to switch? I said, I don't care. I'll, I'll preach during the day if you want. Oh, no, no, that's fine. You know, real. And I, it was just really amazing. He, he wasn't even married. And then there was, no, no, no. You know, this was way back when. So, and he couldn't find ice to save your soul out there. It was hot. So everything you got was kind of, and I can't drink a Coke if it's warm. I got to have it cold, man. And, uh, and it had Sloppy Joes, and, and, some, and there was only one or two vendors that that's what you bought. Well, I didn't have no money, so I done made it my mind, Richard. I'm, not, I'm just going to fast with all I can do. So we all, they got us little cubicles, the speakers, but not much bigger than this where you could, people would come and you could shake their hands and things of that nature, you know. So, boy, I'm sitting there. And I'm getting thirsty. Now I can drink water, but it's hot, you know. And they said, Brother Jesse, would you mind doing some day sessions as well as night? I said, no, man. We'll all just kind of work it together. So I, I walked away from my little cubicle. And I walked, I guess, about from here to about the back end of the church there, going up on the stage to preach to these people. Watch this. I ministered. I came back. When I got back, I had to go back to cubicle. There was chicken and dumplings steaming with Coke with crushed ice. And everybody said, where'd you get that? I said, I don't know. Where'd you get that at? I don't know. Can we have some? No, no, no. <laughs> I said, the Lord <laughs> Boy, I mean, I took that Coke and that crushed ice. I still love crushed ice till the day. Me and Delway, we love crushed ice. I mean, we into it, man. I think, and I ate chicken and dumplings. Just got me in front of the food. And these people eating these uh, sloppy joes. Like, Where'd you guys? I don't know. It was here. I said, did y'all see anybody put it there? No. Okay. That's the first day. The next morning, I'm going to do an 8 o'clock session. They wanted me to do an 8 o'clock session. I walk away. I go do the 8 o'clock session, which is about 8 to about 8.45. I come back, and there's ham and eggs. I said, who put this here? Where'd you get them ham and eggs? I said, I don't know. Who put it? 
The whole three days, I had breakfast, dinner, and supper. Meatloaf, uh, cream potatoes. Everybody else eating them stinking sloppy Joe sandwiches. I got all this hot food. Nobody, know. I said, who put this here? Nobody. Eight years went past. Eight years. I go to Ohio to preach in a barn. This guy built a barn. It's a huge barn, beautiful place, you know. I went preaching, and I, I never go to my taping book table. I come back to the taping book. Here comes a little lady in with a cane and her husband. And, you know, she, he's holding her arm. And she says, you like my food? I said, excuse me? You like my food? And immediately, I said, Parkersburg, West Virginia. She said, I was in a camper, and the Lord told me to look through the window and to feed you. And feed you the best. I said, ma'am, I gained five pounds in three days. <laughs> it touched my heart. And he says, isn't my wife a great cook? Now, why did God wait eight years to reveal that? I thought angels was dropping. <laughs> she was an angel. She said, I always wanted to feed a preacher. And I never had the opportunity. And I haven't had it since. You like cornbread? I said, yes, ma'am. So I brought you some. Man, and everybody was wrong. Hey, what'd you, hey, what'd you get to that? Can I have some? No, no. <laughs> no. Eight years. Never be oblivious to blessing. And God chose. I'm so glad he chose to let me know who that was. I've never forgotten that. And the lesson is, I'll always take care of you. But you see, I had to pass that money test. I had to step out. And I said, that's fine. I have never eaten better in any meeting in my life. I mean, I, that woman could flat cook. You like my food. Well, did you like the food this morning? Amen. Give Jesus a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.